What difference does it make when some people are left out of the picture, when police don't keep data on queer women, for instance, or when the culture looks all white? This week, activist attorney Andrea Ritchie returns with her book, Invisible No More, and Deborah Willis and Hank Willis Thomas, two generations of picture makers, talk about mothers, sons, and radical art. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. New York City police officer was indicted this October on charges that he patronized a 15-year-old girl for prostitution and made videos of her performing sex acts. Stories like that catch the headlines now and then. They're widely denounced, but the seriousness of the denunciations doesn't tend to get reflected in either policymaking or data keeping when it comes to women and policing. The way we collect and analyze data, or don't, actually renders some women and some behavior invisible in ways that have obvious implications, not only for women and police accountability and reform, but for society at large, so says our guest. Andrea Ritchie is an attorney, writer, and longtime activist in the field of policing. No stranger to this program, her latest book is Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. It's out now from Beacon Press. Andrea, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me back. I, I don't know how you actually write books on top of everything else that you're doing, but congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> the title is Invisible No More, but it's sort of anticipatory. I mean, in fact, you describe a lot of violence that is actually extremely invisible um, right now. So bring us up to date. If we were going to have a Me Too campaign that actually addressed women held in detention or incarcerated or just stopped by police, what would that hashtag be revealing? What stories? I think it's very interesting that you pose that question. I do believe that um, we're in the midst of this national conversation about police sexual violence, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and there is a conspicuous absence of conversation about uh, instances when the perpetrator of the sexual assault is a police officer. The case that you just described is unfortunately one, one among many, uh, yet we continue to treat this issue on a case-by-case -case basis rather than as the epidemic that it really is. So if police violence uh, against women of color and black women particularly were truly to be invisible no more, then we would uh, spend a lot more time uh, discussing the kinds of cases that you just described or the one involving the Brooklyn teenager who was pulled over in a traffic stop, arrested for a minor drug offense, placed in handcuffs, and forced to give two officers oral sex in the backseat of a patrol car, which again has sparked, as you just said, sort of widespread outrage and outcry, but not a systemic response. So the conversation would shift, I think, quite a bit if we started to put our focus there. So you tell a lot of stories in the book that are profoundly disturbing, because you're not just filling in empty spots on our reporting, but you're saying there's actually a concerted pattern here that reflects a lot about both policing, the state, and, and us. Indeed, the book is really a book about policing, racial profiling, police violence, mass criminalization through the lens of women's experiences. And when we look at those issues through the lens of women's experiences, we see not only some of the things that we're already seeing, driving while black, uh, walking while black, uh, traffic stops, but then we start to see things that we're not seeing, for instance, like police sexual violence or the policing of motherhood or the ways in which police responses to violence or calls for help reflect many of the same patterns of racial profiling and police violence as what we traditionally think of as, as policing or racial profiling. The book is really sort of uncovering more in the places that we're already looking um, and then also encouraging us to look more broadly at what the shape of policing looks like in this country. And I think what those uh, experiences, what the experiences of women really reveal is uh, the degree to which policing has really infiltrated every single aspect of our society and represents sort of the first point of response for so many of our problems and the consequences of that, both in terms of fatalities, in terms of police violence, in terms of lack of protection, um, and in terms of the ways of, in which gender and sexuality are policed within the larger context of policing of race and poverty. I mean, you describe an intentionality 
around misogyny and assault on women of color that is quite different from normally what we see reported, that, oh, this also happened. At this point, I, I hope, um, convinced of the fact that uh, race is an inherent part of policing and that the origins of police forces and their continuing operation definitely operate along the axis of race and as well as poverty. We're less convinced about how police have always had a role in policing the lines of gender, whether it was about enforcing cross-dressing laws, um, whether it was uh, enforcing morality through common nightwalker laws and policing of prostitution, uh, whether it was enforcing uh, women's ability to be out in the world, dancing, expressing themselves, um, enjoying life, uh, and or right after slavery, black women's ability to be uh, in the workforce on their own terms as opposed to being uh, put back on plantations through uh, convict leasing. And so uh, the policing of gender has been a central factor about, of policing since the foundation of this country, but one that we haven't uh, often looked at. So were there kind of gender codes, like there were black codes that Michelle Alexander writes about? Absolutely, and the black codes were enforced in very gender specific ways. So okay. for instance, um, Sarah Haley writes, uh, quite extensively about how immediately after slavery was abolished, the presence of black women in the public sphere was aggressively policed. So women were arrested for being too loud, for being disorderly, for being quote unquote drunk in public, for not minding their children properly in public. And these were ways um, not only of policing um, black women's mere presence and racialized gendered presence in public spheres, but as I said, also to um, punish them for leaving the homes uh, and, and their jobs as domestic workers, mm. uh, caring for white families on plantations, and in an effort to put them right back there through convict leasing. Paula Giddings, in her biography of the great investigative reporter Ida B. Wells, talks about how those were the laws that were used against her to try to stop her doing the work that she was doing, revealing the truth about lynching. And independent black women who have stood up against injustice um, have consistently been targets of police violence in ways that have also been invisible. So for instance, the famous Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a well-known civil rights activist, was uh, herself beaten and subjected to police sexual violence uh, during an arrest attempting to desegregate a lunch counter. Those are stories that we don't hear as much when we talk about the civil rights movement and movements for racial justice here in the United States. So how does this shift, not just our understanding of policing, but our understanding of what's required for overhaul or reform or abolition or whatever part of that you want to take on. If your call to the police about a domestic violence situation is going to lead to a situation where you'll be at risk of further gender-based violence from that police officer, then maybe we need to rethink how we're responding to violence entirely. Or if, I know, a call for help at a mental health crisis might uh, wind up uh, with someone like Deborah Danner being killed, then and there's research that shows that more than half of um, police killings in the United States involve police responses to mental health crises, and a significant number of those are women, um, including Tanisha Anderson, for instance, who um, was killed three years ago yesterday, then we need to really rethink what our responses are to mental health crises as well, and so on. So I think by looking at these issues through the lens of women exper women's experiences, we get a little bit more quickly to the root of the problem and really needing to do more than a reform here or there and uh, overhauling the system. Tell us the story of Corinne Gaines. Corinne Gaines was someone who had um, been pulled over in a traffic stop, uh, gotten a ticket, decided she wasn't interested in paying it, didn't think it was justified, thought it was a, uh, an instance of racial profiling, and was sitting at home with her child minding her own business when the police showed up to serve a warrant on her for this traffic infraction, this minor traffic infraction, and decided that she didn't think the warrant was justified either. Eight hours later, after an armed siege on her house with her and her child inside, uh, she was shot dead uh, by the police who had laid siege outside her home uh, with her son in the room. And that situation, I think, is one that should lead us all to question why the police were there in the first place, why they laid siege to someone's house for eight hours instead of deciding that maybe they should go about this perhaps a different way, and why they felt like it was okay to shoot into a house um, in which a black mother and her child uh, were residing. So there's a whole chapter in the book around policing motherhood that not only talks about the ways in which for instance, child welfare uh, imitates parallels and intersects with policing, but also literally talks about how police interact with pregnant women. What that indicates about how they perceive black mothers and their children. Well, what does it indicate? I mean, there's one police officer who literally said, you know, we don't like 
black pregnant women. I mean, and that as he slapped one in the face. And so that is essentially, I think, a reflection of um, the way society perceives black motherhood um, as something that is somehow inherently deviant, is no longer valuable now that it's not producing enslaved people, um, and is a burden on society, and, and that police officers feel empowered to literally kick, punch, punish, tase, um, and abuse. And then I think not the helped, you'd have to say, by all the sort of welfare queen rhetoric exactly. that we've seen from politicians of both parties, actually. Exactly. And you know, the, the controlling narratives around black women that really drive police interactions are that black women are a threat, right? So for instance, uh, Breonna right. King was an Austin, Texas school teacher who was pulled over in a traffic stop and thrown around like a rag doll and tased by police officers for no reason. And when she asked on her way to the precinct, why did you all treat me that way? The officer said to her, because we perceive black people as threatening. And they said that to a small black woman. Yeah. So what that shows is that the perceptions that we tend to ascribe police officers having around black men apply with equal force to black women. And then there are the gender specific ones that you just mentioned. Welfare queen, promiscuous, overly aggressive, overly animalistic that lead to uh, the kinds of mistreatment described in the book. Now you have uh, personal stories that you include at the top of this book, which you say you haven't really kind of concentrated on before, but in retrospect kind of realized, oh, they did play a, a role in shaping your understanding of all this. Talk about you at 14, 15, 16. I think I was like a lot of young women and you know the research shows that police officers definitely uh, target young women for a number of reasons. One, they have access to a lot of young women, whether they're placed in schools, whether the young women are participating in explorer programs, or young women are out in the community, as I was. Um, and then they also target people who might not have a place to stay at night, which was the case uh, when that, uh, those incidents happened to me. And then they target people who they think will not complain. I told those stories because I would often challenge women in the movement who um, consistently sort of, as we all do, stood up for their sons, their partners, their parents, their brothers. Why are we not standing up for ourselves and for our sisters? And why not we, we're not telling our own stories and those of the women in our community that we all know because we tell them to each other privately and we organize around them privately, but we don't bring them into the larger conversation and then realize that I hadn't uh, responded to my own challenge. <laughs> so I felt uh, compelled to in the book, but I think that it's, it's certainly not unique. Uh, it's a story that I've heard many, many times from many, many young women. Um, in New York City, in fact, uh, two in five young women report sexual harassment by police officers, research shows, and the vast majority of those are black, Latina, and Asian. Uh, young women. So there may or may not be a prosecution, there may or not be discipline, the officer may or not be fired. But then that's, we hear nothing more of it. So that officer can go on and work in the next jurisdiction over without any consequences. And in fact, it's so common that researchers have a term for it called the officer shuffle. They just shuffle on down to another jurisdiction to commit the same harms. This is really a systemic problem. This is really an epidemic that we need to strike at the root of. Um, we really owe it to survivors to strike at the root of the problem. All right, so how do we do that? Well, you mean more intersectional analysis, talking, and invis less invisibility? <laughs> well, certainly more in intersectional analysis never <laughs> hurts anybody. Um, but we really need to start um, looking to prevention. Accountability is important after the fact, but prevention is even more important, which means we need to start looking um, using collecting data so that we can start to see more clearly where the patterns are. Uh, we need to look at individual officer behaviors. Uh, one way that police departments do this is they start to look at how the percentage of female traffic stops, the percentage of female pedestrian stops, and their outcomes to see if police officers might be um, targeting female uh, women during stops. Um, we need to look at uh, sort of, we need to talk to women when they, uh, who have experienced police interactions do sort of after the fact, uh, not police officers, but community groups, and after the fact need to check in with women and say, well, did anything happen during that encounter that made you uncomfortable? Was there anything, any sexual uh, nature to the interaction? Start asking, making space, making room, making it clear that we care about this issue, raising public awareness of it. Um, and then we need to look at the situations where it happens and start to address the really structural factors around policing that make it possible. So police operate, uh, in isolation, they have access to a lot of young people, they have a lo access to a lot of people in a one-on-one -on -one interaction without much supervision with a great deal of discretion. So we need to look at um, 
youth engagement programs, which are a huge site of police sexual violence. Start looking at where it's happening, how it's happening, why it's happening, and addressing those problems. Does the gender of the police officer or the police force more broadly matter if we had more women cops, commanders, chiefs? My clients who have experienced similar things have, at the hands of female officers have said they felt no less violated. In fact, perhaps felt more violated um, because they felt that the women should have known better. I've seen studies that have also shown that female police officers are more violent to black women in particular. So I think that there's um, there are studies on, uh, not enough studies at all um, in this arena, but to the extent that they exist, they're, um, they're not conclusive. It's not the people, it's the institution that's right. the issue. Thank you so much, Andrea. As always, the book is great. Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. Also talks a lot about violence against trans women and others. Thank you so much for the work and for coming in and telling us about it. Thank you so much for having me. Last November, the Laura Flanders Show was in New Orleans for TED Women, a convening of some of today's most innovative creators, thinkers, and doers, all speaking under the banner of the events theme this year, Bridges. Our next guests were there, aptly enough, speaking in a session titled Connect. Deborah Willis is a photographer, a prolific one. She's published upwards of 20 books of her work and is viewed as a kind of icon in her field, covering everything from the history of black photography to the Obamas. At a time when photography and the arts in general were largely dominated by white males, Willis emerged as something of a phenom. And if you already find out that you know her work, you'll understand why in a moment. She's a recipient of the MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships and chair of the Department of Photography and imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. And the talent in that family doesn't end with her. Her son, Hank Willis Thomas, is a renowned artist in his own right, working in photography, video, and installations with a similar focus on identity, history, and popular culture. His work's been exhibited around the world, too, including the Guggenheim Bilbao, the National Gallery of Art in DC, and the Museum of Modern Art right here in New York City. I had a chance to talk with them both together. Take a look. This is our sixth talk together. It's um, funny because it's like role reversal. He is now my father at times, and I'm, I'm trying to um, guide him through. But he's it's it's humorous and it's fun, and I'm enjoying it. I was interested in becoming a photographer even in high school. Told by a, a guidance counselor it was impossible. She laughed at me. I went to a junior college and then ended up going to my art school that I wanted to attend, Philadelphia College of Art, to study photography. As a result of that experience, I was excited about making images. And then I had one professor who decided to, another one, to put a damper on my interest in being a photographer and said, that was taking up a good man's space and I should be, all I was going to do was have a baby. And I decided I wasn't going to let him stop me. And I started making photographs about my experiences as a photographer living in Philadelphia. And I did get pregnant the next year. And, and it really, it just made me step, pause for a second, just to think about the negative experience of what it meant that a man could tell a woman's body that it's, it's wrong to get pregnant, it's wrong to have a dream to be an artist. And so it affected me in a, in a way that I decided to just photograph my pregnant belly and my body changing over time. I learned actually through osmosis a lot of the history of photography through my mother's research as an artist, but also as a curator at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and then at the Smithsonian. And, and I would just be a kid playing in the stacks and doing things that probably you shouldn't do around archival <laughs> material. but. Uh, I think it was also kind of, I was absorbing a lot subconsciously. I like to read the family album. I love to look at the way that the women were dressed. I love the inscriptions. So I think the family album is really a central way for us to know about our memories and to tell stories. Later on, I realized that in the larger society, no one actually looked at black families as a central way of knowing a sense of being or a sense of existence. In 1968, during the Memphis Sanitation Workers March, 
a photographer, African-American photographer named Ernest Withers photographed dozens of protesters holding signs that read, I am a man. And I always reflected on that image with curiosity because there was a statement of collectivity when people were fighting segregation and after integration it seemed to be a, a boastful statement in saying I'm the man and I felt that there was progress in being able to be an individual but also things that are lost when we don't see the benefits of collective struggle. The importance of, of post-slavery period, creating their own biography, their own autobiography. I want to tell a story about my existence, my existence with my two children, three children, my existence in terms of style of dress, my existence of being free. Photographers were significant in making that statement. Um, it was an opportunity for blacks to marry for the first time. They were legally able to vote. Men were legally able to vote um, some in, in some parts of the country. And so it, it brought this sense of humanity back. And I think photography was central in terms of recognizing that sense of humanity and, and memory in that way. It was really significant for me to know that one of the earliest photographers who brought photography to America was a black man, unknown in my history books of, of photography. Jules Leon, he had a daguerreotype studio here in, in New Orleans. In 1840, he, was, he had a studio um, on Charter Street. So um, thinking about that, it was important because the absence of the discussion of black photographers, the absence of black people who had businesses and, and families, people think that black people did not have a sense of desire outside of being the servant or the um, stoop labor in terms of that period. I'm writing a book about the black Civil War soldier. And I didn't know that there were black Civil War soldiers when I was in high school. I found images of you know, my great, great uncles who were in World War I. And the sense of pride that happens in looking at family photographs, because pride was denied for black people when we visualize images of black people through the lens of racist photography. Within my mother's work, I th one of the things that I think really had a profound effect on me was this idea of the camera being a tool of the sitter. Her image was an opportunity for, it was her I am, a way to stake a claim and to represent herself in spite of the way that there were caricatures and other ways that uh, stories of people of African descent were being um, disseminated. And I think I'm always trying to bring the past present with my work. I'm really interested in learning lessons from the past and trying to kind of make statements in the now that ranges from sculptures that I've made based off photographs at the fall of the Berlin Wall. There's another photograph by a photographer named Ernest Cole of miners being strip searched in South Africa in the 1960s. And I wanted to represent it, but I wanted to crop it. And so I represented it as a sculpture and I cropped it at their shoulders. And you could just see the heads and their arms up. And I titled it Raise Up. And in the summer of 2014, Michael Brown was murdered by a police officer. And the cry by the public was, hands up, don't shoot. And my sculpture spoke very, very eloquently and clearly to people who were fighting for human rights and equal rights in the 21st century. My project is In Search of Beauty and it's, it's not any specific look. It's just in, in terms of just a way of understanding who we are as a people looking for that. And so I'm looking now at friends who are traveling and looking at their closets because the same aspect in terms of how do we think about, re about identity through clothing and thinking about how do we get respect or understand who we are through dress. You can find out more about the Willises and their work and check out their TED talk through the links at our website, lauraflanders.com. And while you're there, if you want to hear my commentary of this week, sign up to become a regular subscriber. Thank you to TED Women for their help in New Orleans. You're going to be seeing more from our visit there in the weeks ahead. It's been great to have you watching. See you next time. I'm Laura.